The center of Paris is imploding, and the capital doesn't have much green space left for its two million inhabitants. By comparison, Berlin has around 25 square meters of green space per inhabitant. In London, it's 45 square meters, but central Paris has only five square meters. Do these extreme urban conditions mean the end of biodiversity, be it plant or animal? And just what has managed to survive of this ravaged nature? Nathalie Machon is an ecologist specialized in the plant life of Paris, which she tracks down in the most built-up, improbable corners of the city. Of the world's big cities, Paris is not necessarily the one with the most biodiversity, because it wasn't planned around large city parks or around forests, even though we do have the Bois de Vincennes and the Bois de Boulogne, which play an important environmental role. But all in all, there are a good number of species that manage to live in Paris. There are an estimated 1,000 species of wild plants, plants not cultivated by the Parisians. And there are a lot of birds, quite a lot of insects, snails, little creatures that we can't necessarily see, but they're there, living with us. And so for naturalists in search of biodiversity, the Parisian parks and squares are a happy hunting ground. That's the song of the short-toed tree creeper. It's calling back. That crow just took a bath, and now he's smoothing his feathers. He's perched up there to catch the sunlight, and he's grooming his plumage, as birds always do after a bath. We have about 60 resident species that nest in Paris, but to that figure, you have to add all the transient birds, birds that come through on their migrations, that come and stay for winter. They don't nest here in Paris, but they do make up part of the biodiversity. Paris wildlife boasts more than a thousand wild plants, buttercups, speedwell, ferns, orchids, and thousands of animal species mostly insects. But the inventories are still in progress, and for scientists, these figures still aren't satisfactory. The ecologists at the Museum of Natural History are forever warning the capital about the fragility of its biodiversity. We've taken stock of the plants. We have a good idea of the number of birds. We know pretty much what butterflies and beetles we have, okay. But the figures are derisory compared to an overall biodiversity of thousands and thousands of species. We can't boast about a thriving biodiversity just because we've catalogued two or three thousand of these species. We're far behind other cities like Berlin or Vienna. And that brings us to why this is. Paris is a city center. It's not a city with residential neighborhoods and large urban landscaped parks. We don't have that in Paris. Overpopulated, dense, cramped, Paris is suffocating and its biodiversity is being stifled. The capital would like to be greener, but doesn't know how to go about it. To bring about such a transformation, it would have to push back its walls. And the problem it always runs up against is that age-old handicap, a chronic lack of space. In the fourth century, back in Roman times when Paris was called Lutetia, it was already a compact city crouched on the banks of the River Seine. The Roman city was on the south bank of the Seine. It went more or less from where the Pantheon is today to where you now have the Jardin des Plantes. That was the Roman city. 
Subsequently, it developed outwards in concentric circles. Down through the centuries, Paris would keep this configuration, continually rebuilding on top of itself. And in addition to this concentric spread, there was another hindrance, the successive sets of outer walls. The ramparts the city had time after time erected for defense ended up by confining it. And in a way, the périphérique, the ring road circling Paris, is the last of those ramparts. Completed in 1973, this 35 kilometer ribbon of asphalt surrounds the capital and isolates it from its suburbs. The population continues to grow, but its area hardly at all. Paris is now one of the world's most densely populated cities. Over 21,000 inhabitants per square kilometer, twice the density of New York. You could describe Paris as a city that is large, compact, dense and old, with some widely scattered breathing spaces. For a long time, Paris considered nature inappropriate and forced it out beyond the city walls. The only green oases were quite artificial, completely man-made and reserved for the elite. This was the case of the Tuileries Gardens, entirely redesigned in the 17th century by André Le Nôtre at the request of Louis XIV. At first, the Tuileries Gardens carried on the concept of the closed space, of the symbolic cloistered gardens of the Middle Ages. Later, they opened out onto the landscape. But initially, the garden was a closed, intimate space, an ideal world, where nature had been tamed and groomed, lawns trimmed down to the millimeter, all strictly laid out, greenery, boxwood trees, oaks, etc., all pruned, trees planted in straight lines, which is not really how nature is. This nature, all parceled up and contained, was long off limits to the general public. It was not opened up to Parisians until the French Revolution. Eventually, in the second half of the 19th century, Baron Haussmann's urban renewal project under Napoleon III opened up more green spaces to the population. Haussmann's idea was to create promenades in Paris. In other words, a large network made up of the two major parks and other parks, gardens, tree-lined boulevards and avenues. The idea was for Paris to have a garden in each neighborhood. And so, for the first time, they created a network design so that everyone would have a garden nearby. Today, Paris has over 400 squares, parks and gardens, along with its two vast parks, the Bois de Vincennes in the east and the Bois de Boulogne in the west. But for the scientists, this is insufficient and too fragmented to have any significant effect on biodiversity. And yet, Osman's urban renewal project with its goal of creating a green network was truly visionary. For today, reconnecting the islands of nature to create a green urban network is at the heart of Paris's environmental ambitions. To achieve this, the city is now searching out the least bit of space to re-green. And suddenly, places that were previously never imagined as natural now seem obvious choices. Like the banks of the Seine, that long 13-kilometer serpent gripped in the talons of the automobile traffic. Until now, Paris saw its river as a strictly functional navigation corridor. But today, a radically new process seems to be at work. In 2013, Paris, in creating the first public garden on the water, made the leap from virtual to real.
This installation has to work on three different levels. First, we're on barges, so we have floating objects to deal with. On top of that, there's the whole garden aspect. And lastly, it's open to the public, with all the safety regulations that that implies. It's the fruit of two and a half years' work. That's right. It's an amazing technical feat with a system of islands moored to sturdy piles sunk into the riverbed down to a depth of eight meters, which allows the islands on their huge piles to rise and fall with the water level, and even withstand floods that can happen once a century, like the one back in 1910. These five little islands, which cover 1,800 square meters, are a haven of greenery with 3,000 grasses, 60 trees, 280 bushes, a parcel of natural landscape resting on a steel structure. So here we're in a rather special place, in the hold of the barge. These are huge 170-ton metal caissons that buoy up the soil. Down here we have a whole system to regulate the flotation which means keeping the barge level at all times. Not perfectly level, but as level as possible. And also a pumping system in case of accident. And lastly, another waterworks system dedicated to watering the whole garden. So here, Paris is launching a program to reclaim the river, as well as an innovative process of renewing the public urban space. The point of this project is to see how we can take a different approach to the public space. I think the city of tomorrow, and even of today, is a city that is constantly updating, meaning that we'll have our finger on the pulse of what people want, then work with them to make it happen. But these projects are quite costly. This one cost more than 8 million euros. It's easy to see why this is Paris's only floating garden. Yet the Seine does have an important role to play in the urban space of tomorrow, and this floating garden is merely a part of the development project along the river. The mayor of Paris is declaring war on the almighty automobile and has made reclaiming the riverbanks the linchpin of his ecology program. According to figures published by City Hall, this pedestrian program has, over 10 years, led to a 25% decrease in motor vehicle traffic, which in turn has greatly improved air quality. And Parisians are forging ahead to bring nature back to the spaces that have so long been denied to them. A case in point is the Petite Ceinture, the abandoned railroad tracks that circle Paris. It's 32 kilometers long and covers 50 hectares. At the request of the local inhabitants, City Hall has turned over a few stretches to allotment gardens. A few plots of greenery along this vast expanse that was just going to seed. The Wiseau Garden in the northern part of the railroad ring is one of the city's oldest shared gardens. A festive place to celebrate nature while spreading the word on ecology. The goal is to reclaim space from steel and concrete. We started out as a group of neighbors back in 1998. We'd been living here near the abandoned Ring Railroad for a few years, and at the time, people were using it as a dump. So our idea was to make the place pretty so that people would respect it. And we were wondering how we could do that. What if we started by planting flowers up there on the slopes near the street so people could enjoy the sight of hollyhocks and poppies? That would make a change, and it was just magical. Now this here is a tank with an aquatic ecosystem. We set it up with the help of naturalists. It's meant to make the spot attractive, to add a touch of beauty. There's the calm of the water, and also to favor biodiversity and create an aquatic ecosystem. So now we're waiting for the dragonflies. Here we have our worm farm. 
It's known as vermicomposting. People bring their organic kitchen waste here. That's the first phase. It has several phases. On the second level, you can see the worms and a whole lot of little bugs. They transform it all and produce very good quality compost. The Ruisseau Gardens are the result of a grassroots movement to stake out green space in the city. And it's not the only case in Paris, for since the 2000s, the capital has seen 93 shared gardens sprout up, mainly in the east in working-class Paris, which has long been deprived of nature. This green movement has even spread to the streets, ready to push back the walls of Paris. And no nook or cranny is too small to plant. Sidewalks, balconies, alleys, courtyards, new kinds of flower pot. The least crack in the asphalt can play its part. Even tree bases, which in some neighborhoods are tended with loving care. Paris has more than 100,000 street trees, trees that the inhabitants hope to keep from becoming eyesores by cultivating them. There are a lot of trees in Paris, so if all the tree bases were planted with flowers, we might see the city in a new light. Every little bit helps. We also hope it will stop people dumping stuff here and prevent vandalism. I just think a green space is more effective than a fence. There's a newfound appreciation of this small-scale nature, this everyday local nature, on the part of the scientific community, but also on the part of the local inhabitants as well, because this small scale allows them to take an active part. They can mobilize on this scale, not on the large landscapes. So this neighborhood nature, if you like, is very relevant. It's a means of environmental education. It's a vehicle to transmit knowledge, and it's also a very valid vehicle for social interaction. The task facing the cities is, in fact, to connect up the ecological corridors. And that means using the infraspaces, if we can call them that, like tree bases. An improvement of the urban decor, but also the revival of neglected social relationships. This pavement level action has multiple benefits. But beyond the green aspirations of the city dwellers, do these micro parcels help improve Paris's biodiversity? Do they play a part in the city's network of green belts? Alors de plus en plus, on met en œuvre we're progressively putting into effect a policy aimed at reconnecting all the spaces. And we call that the Green Belt Corridors, meaning all the zones inhabitable by plant and animal life and the corridors that connect them taken as a whole. So, in the city, what can play a part in the Green Belt? We asked this question about the street trees, and in effect, we found that for a certain number of not very mobile species, growing them at the foot of these trees allowed more isolated populations to connect with one another. The fragmentation of the city had led to certain populations becoming isolated from one another. And when the individuals, for example, the plants or animals of the same species, have no choice but to reproduce among themselves, it leads to inbreeding. This gives rise to genetic problems that cause the species to die out locally. Since any individuals that appear are incapable of living and reproducing in a viable way. When species have no mobility, extinction is never far away. The green belts and landscape connectivity are goals that must figure into any green policy for the city, even more so as cities make up 21% of France's territory. 
So the urban environment has a definite role to play in the preservation of biodiversity and a responsibility that implies giving up an extremely harmful practice, that of using chemical products in the management of green spaces. The city of Paris is now aware of this and has drastically cut its use of pesticides. This ecological policy has led to an unhoped for paradox. Whereas bees are dying out in the country, they're making a comeback in Paris. Europe's largest urban hive is right on the outskirts of Paris in Saint-Denis, across from the imposing basilica that was once the tomb of the kings and queens of France. Here, five million bees produce a nectar that celebrates the marriage of city and nature. When we spoke with beekeepers out in the country and they told us their problems, well, there was not so much a feeling of jealousy, just incomprehension as to how we in the city could manage to turn out honey, whereas they in their traditional honey-producing regions couldn't anymore. That's a clear indication that a healthy bee is a bee that makes honey. Nowadays, in certain regions, they die before they're able to produce any. The city is a more favorable environment for the bees because it's free of pesticides and predators. Paris has 350 hives and seems to have grasped the vital mechanisms of its busily pollinating guests. More than 60% of our food is pollinated by bees, so we need bees. It's a wonderful thing how the bee needs to cross-pollinate flowers and the plants and flowers need to find an insect to ensure their reproduction. That means that if bees were to die out, we'd have a big problem producing fruit. No more fruit, no more flowers. No more flowers, no more grasses, no more grasses, no more man. It breaks down the entire food chain. That gives rise to a problem that is quite simply vital. The return of the bees is an ideal occasion for the scientific community to remind people of the benefits of nature. We call this ecosystem services. That is, the benefits that man derive from ecological systems. So there is a supply service, because nature supplies us with food and drink. There are regulatory services. It's nature that absorbs all our pollution, and nature regulates itself. Then there is a third very important service that's been pointed out, the cultural services, the aesthetic, the well-being, education and recreation that are simply indispensable to man's survival and which are generously provided by nature. An increasing number of studies show that the quality of life of city dwellers is closely linked to the quality of biodiversity, and in particular plant biodiversity, because that's perhaps what people see first, notice the most when walking around the city. The stark built-up districts where there aren't many green spaces, where you don't have much plant life, are much harder to live in. Not only from a psychological, but also from a health point of view. We could save money on health care if we took better care of biodiversity. So it's important. To live with nature, but also to use nature to prevent future climatic catastrophes, this is the concept of the resilient city, a city that will adapt to be ready for the worst. You could say the great heat wave of 2003 was a wake-up call, because all of a sudden, for 10 consecutive days in August, Paris was getting 350 deaths a day instead of 50. And the majority of those deaths occurred in the neighborhoods without any trees that could provide shade and cause evapotranspiration, which lowers the temperature. Those were the neighborhoods that were hit the hardest. Trees lining a boulevard lower the temperature by three degrees, and that has an enormous impact on global warming. Urban planners and communities are well aware of this. It means creating green roofs, vegetal walls, getting more shade onto more streets. It's nature, not nature alone, but nature as well, that makes a city resilient. Since the city first understood that nature can help it meet the environmental challenges of tomorrow, it has gone wholeheartedly into a greening program. And now the sky's the limit. 
Between now and 2020, the city is planning to create seven hectares of green vegetal roofs. Thanks to its roofs, Paris hopes to become a greener capital, better prepared to face global warming and to attract increased biodiversity. The first installment was the roof of the Beaugrenelle shopping mall, a concrete complex on the left bank of the Seine. It is now the city's largest hanging garden, 7,000 square meters of greenery in the heart of Paris. It looks very simple, but in fact, there was 40 centimeters of soil, tons and tons of soil that had to be integrated into the building. Then there's another amazing thing. Nothing is protruding. Usually the roof of a shopping mall has all sorts of air conditioning equipment, pipes, air intakes, horrible stuff. But here, all that was integrated into the body of the building, something that's not visible but is perhaps one of the most difficult things to accomplish. In fact, it's a key step in making rooftop gardens. I should also mention that we stock rainwater to water all the greenery, so we don't consume any water. Also, the layer of soil acts as an insulator. It provides thermal insulation to limit heat loss. Then there's the garden effect, etc. So, all told, it's extremely ecological. Paris has proudly announced that up to 80 hectares of the city's roofs could potentially be greened. So, in these new spaces, has the city found the green links for its future green belts? There's no ecology in all that, none at all. For all the green roofs they've been creating now, they're just rolling out sedum mats, and that has a limited benefit for biodiversity, extremely limited. So my team and I are working on that now, to find out what kind of substrates are best, what thickness, how deep it has to go, in order to have flowers and insects, and how to keep management costs to a minimum to make it more sustainable. Complex, costly, and, according to some, of limited ecological benefit, green roofs are a contentious issue. Nevertheless, the designers of the Beaugrenelle Garden did make a strong statement in favor of ecology by making this roof a sanctuary reserved for plant and animal life. On the roof of the Agro Paris Tech School, they're using the space in a new way that might just placate the critics. The roof hasn't just become a wildlife sanctuary or been greened, it has become productive farmland. In Paris, urban farming is still in its infancy. But scientists are studying the food question, and agronomist Nicolas Bell is tackling it by creating urban vegetable gardens where he's testing different substrates. Here you can see a striking difference between the planters with potting soil and the planters with a richer ecosystem. That's coffee grounds there. Why coffee grounds? Because there's a fungus that grows in the coffee grounds, so it's full of mycelium. Mycelium is the body of the fungus. It enriches the soil because it spreads throughout the wood chips. How do you account for this difference? Potting soil isn't a living material, so it degrades. Its structure, for example, eventually gets packed down. Also, the nutrients dissolve in water, and then they leach out. So the first year, the potting soil is fine. The second year, it really doesn't work as well, and the third year, even less. Here, we can afford to pick the tomatoes when they are ripe. So we eat them right off the vine, and they're so much better. Then there's strawberries and raspberries, which are very fragile. So it's much better to grow fruits like them on a rooftop. I think there are three or even four positive points to this type of urban farming on buildings. The first is food production, even if it will never be a very large-scale operation quantity-wise. The second benefit is social. We know that collective gardens on the rooftops foster social relationships. The third point is what I'd call environmental. The possibility of this type of farming playing a part in recycling urban waste. At least that's what we're trying to do at the test farm on the roof of Agro Paritech. 
But it can go even further with the recuperation of rainwater, thermal regulation, cultivated biodiversity, which is still biodiversity. When we embarked on this experiment, we didn't necessarily foresee that this form of new green space would attract bees, for example. And we found an entire population of insects settling on this roof. So that contributes to recreating cultivated and even spontaneous plant and animal biodiversity. It's my theory that if we produce food, if we recycle urban waste, and if there's the determination in urban farming for these agriculture systems to be as autonomous as possible, we'll make a significant contribution to these ecosystem services. So that's the challenge. Now we have to make it work. Though the role of urban farming in the development and enrichment of biodiversity is still being studied, it seems to be having a positive impact. Green rooftops, cultivated tree bases, the ring railroad preserved, the greening of the riverbanks. Driven by popular opinion, builders and scientists, the green movement is blazing a trail now being followed by urban planners and political decision makers. But what will be the outcome? Philippe Jacob is the head of the Parisian Observatory of Biodiversity, an institution founded by the city in 2012 to coordinate the observations of amateur nature lovers. Since the 1990s and 2000s, a certain number of species have made a comeback, and it's most evident with the animals. There are birds like the kingfisher or the peregrine falcon that have come back to Paris recently and are reproducing, which goes to show that there's definitely something happening in the field here. The fox has been making a comeback over the past 15 years too. It has slowly and quietly come back to the Bois de Boulogne and there are more and more of them in Paris in areas like the Petite Ceinture and the banks of the Seine. For us, these are all very positive, meaningful signs. For the time being, biodiversity is on the rise in Paris. There are more species simply because the city decided to do without pesticides. And that's extremely beneficial for the wild plants as well as for the insects and for all the animals that eat insects. The River Seine itself, which just a few years ago was considered at death's door, seems to be coming back to life. I'm taking samples of the mosses and algae growing on the banks. This little moss is called Octodiceros, and it has a house guest, a little Gamarus shrimp that lives in this moss and does quite well there. Yes, there are more fish than before. We've counted up to 40 different species. We estimate that there's a group of 20 to 25 relatively common species that turn up regularly with fairly healthy populations. We have juvenile fish, perch, pike, roach. In spite of it all, the species are capable of adapting somewhat and finding what they need in order to reproduce, to feed and so to complete their life cycles successfully and thrive. In central Paris, the most fecund natural element is the Seine. Some people call it Paris's 21st arrondissement. And it's certainly the one with the most nature in it. Will the blue ribbon of the Seine overtake the green belt? The return and diversification of living species are positive signs, but scientists claim that's still not enough. For a greener future, Paris has to plan even further and overcome the historical constraints still imposed by the city center.
As an ecologist, I'm aiming for a very interconnected landscape with a focus on the riverbanks. Paris can't remain isolated. The ring road and the suburbs have to be integrated into the city. It would be a mistake to confine our projects to the city centre and not to reach out to the Bois de Boulogne, the Bois de Vincennes and other parks and forests. The whole concept of green belts loses its meaning unless it's completely incorporated into a more global, holistic vision. Like that of the regional project for ecological coherence, which all the regions are working on now, especially the departments that have the job of integrating the city and the metropolitan area into a larger scheme of protected areas and corridors. If the green movement is to gain momentum, it has to break the concentric mindset by creating ecological corridors running from the center to the outskirts and start thinking big. Of particular interest are the boundary spaces, intersection points that could favor this process. There are new spaces to be claimed, like here at the Otoy racetrack, at the western edge of the city by the Bois de Boulogne, where Michel Pena has managed to create a public landscaped garden. We created a big open swathe without too many tall trees, because the track has to be visible. This project was designed as a link. We're trying to re-establish the links in places that were split up. We're trying to put them back together to piece together parcels of the city that were separated, that have been fragmented by history, by landowners, that wanted to fence themselves off from one another. And I think that in terms of work, not just on the landscape, but also on the territory, a big part of it is recreating these connections. The second goal we've set for ourselves is to increase biodiversity, introducing nature into the very heart of the cities, which have been extremely artificialized. And yes, it's possible in the cities, it's possible everywhere, since there's no city and country anymore. All over the world, it's just one big city that is more or less dense wherever you go. So we thought about this concept of one city and about what we could do and how we could create a genuine asset and truly natural areas right there in the city. To occupy the fringes of the city so biodiversity can cross-breed and grow, this is the goal of those who have realized just how much the future depends on this reconciliation with nature. But it often runs up against the pressures of the real estate business and immovable buildings. No matter, the stakes are too high and even the most built-up areas must succumb. La Défense, just west of Paris. Europe's number one business district, a realm of concrete, glass, and steel, where it seems it would take a miracle for man and nature to coexist. And this is where renowned landscape architect Gilles Clément has created an island of greenery that seems to battle with the looming skyscrapers. In this mineral environment, it's just because we reject it that nature doesn't come here, because we're killing it with our toxic pesticides. But just look, we're surrounded by these buildings, all this concrete. So what? There are still plenty of birds and insects. This regeneration just happened because we don't use any toxic products here. It's practically a wild garden. It's not an abandoned lot or wasteland. The plant life didn't just come on its own. We planted right from the start. But there are also a lot of plants that colonize the in-between spaces where we didn't plant, and they took over the ground. There are different grasses that we didn't put in. They came on their own, and that's a good thing. So we can make nature come, or at least it will come if we accept it. All we have to do is say, yes, I accept it.
For a long time, cities drove nature out beyond their walls. Now, those same cities feel the need to reconnect with nature, and often in its most pastoral form. Here on the fringes of Paris, on these former farmlands eroded by urbanization, the ancestral rural memory has been revived, faithfully reenacting the herd migrations of long ago. I feel like I'm, I don't know, down in the heart of Auvergne. It's a hike in the country with sheep. And so, without any official green light, La Ferme du Bonheur, the farm of happiness, an urban farming project was created just a stone's throw from La Défense. Right now, there's a whole bureaucratic can of worms that allows us to carry on until someone says, this has gone on long enough. We're going to pour in concrete, pour in money. Meanwhile, we're pushing it. And the icing on the cake here, every Sunday, is the little community that has grown up. All kinds of people, from the most down-to-earth to the most cultivated, come and put in some time working, or not. It's rather touching. We don't have to tell them much, and everyone has the same instincts. They know how to work with the earth. Slipping into the cracks of the city, Roger Desprez has reclaimed the forgotten territory. His goal is to breathe new life into this plot of unused land. First to clean it up and put it in order, and then why not to plant and produce, a project with universal aspirations. I come from Italy. I'm from California. Uh, before there was also uh, a girl from Sweden, Anna. The projects I find most interesting are the ones that stretch your limits, that aim to draw man closer to nature, towards a kind of simplicity. That's what I like. It really moves me that now, after two years, we've got this rural landscape. It blows me away. I thought, God, if we push this project far enough, maybe the big concrete money bags will have no choice but to acknowledge our work. Even more so now that everyone is talking about urban farming, which is a Western technocratic term for ecological necessity, alimentary independence, even alimentary survival. And if we do win this battle, it would be a beautiful message of hope, because it would prove that people can take political action in every sense of the term, whether it's property, social, political or moral. With the Farm of Happiness, Roger Desprez has taken an abandoned lot and made it into something with a cultivated heart. But all around, he's left it wild. It's very intelligent. He's put animals in there and he's farming. These are very precious places. Look at the future of humanity right now. It depends on the very diversity it's exploiting. These so-called abandoned, neglected, unknown plots where we don't even know exactly what's growing. These are precious places. Treasures, in fact. So the way he defied the authorities to take over that parcel of land should be acknowledged and even rewarded. Flower gardens, vegetable gardens, empty lots, tree bases, rooftops, all these initiatives are part of the Back to Nature movement in Paris. But with all the environmental challenges in store, they're not enough. Reinventing the territory on a large scale is undoubtedly the solution to preserving and enriching the biodiversity of tomorrow. This is what the capital has undertaken in launching a project with the promising name of Le Grand Paris, a project aimed at increasing the area of the city a hundredfold to make it a world-class metropolis. The Greater Paris Project, by linking the city up to the vast parks and forests that dot the region, would open up very exciting possibilities for natural reserves. The high-rise buildings, an ecological complex. The suburbs, an ocean of greenery. The city, an unbroken ribbon flowing all the way to the sea. Le Grand Paris has quickly become a buzzing hive of new ideas and a fertile terrain for the wildest dreams of grandeur. Too good to be true? 
Clearly, development is the top priority now. They're going to keep on planning and developing buildings and transportation so everyone can get to work and so we can construct housing near train stations. The means of transportation are all being developed at present. But the planning groups working on the Grand Paris just don't get the notion of green belts. And I think that's a big, big problem. We see how important they are for leisure activities, just to have space. But the concept of real services rendered by nature, by biodiversity, is pretty much alien to the majority of decision makers and to the public. It's a denial of all the work we've been doing, especially since we feel we have a clear grasp of these very serious problems that truly impact the quality of people's lives. And we're just not being heard. It's extremely frustrating. The fact that Le Grand Paris has neglected the environmental questions is harmful to biodiversity. But there's an increasingly active movement, aware that the essential thing is to keep creating green belts and taking the city beyond its historical limits. Perhaps the solution can be found right here in Marcoussi, 30 kilometers south of Paris. For a long time, we thought of the city as limited to the built-up district. But the notion of the ecosystem of the city covers the entire spectrum of issues and habitats necessary for the reproduction of urban species. So you could say that the city has a responsibility for the quality of the water and the quality of the air. But it can also be involved in the question of food. This is not merely a theory. Thierry Laverne has already put it into action. Once he was elected to the town council, he convinced five communities to slow down urbanization and preserve farmlands. This united front has created a new type of territory midway between urban and rural, a more large-scale organization, more porous and less compartmentalized. The tomatoes are there? Right, tomatoes, aubergines, and peppers. We're really close to the city. At night, you can see the top of the Eiffel Tower from here with the rotating spotlights. About 20 years ago, we thought the main threat to this place was that people thought it was an empty space where they could do whatever they wanted. Saving farming was certainly not a priority. I think it's too late to defend farming, it's a dream. We have to establish the conditions, not for farming to defend itself, but for it to project itself into the future as an indispensable element of the urban project, so to speak. Now with the Grand Paris and the Ile-de-France projects being discussed, it's important to realize that it's in the outskirts, in starting in the outskirts, that we can reinvent the city of the future. Okay, let's go see the orchard. The proven benefits of ecosystem services, the need for food, a desire for social bonds and a greener urban environment, nature is a fount of well-being and is gradually convincing the capital how much it needs it. So what will tomorrow's Paris look like? Blue Seine or green prairie? Vertical or horizontal? Technology or ecology? Whatever its new face, Paris will need those ecological corridors to reconcile the concrete with the plants, the exuberance of nature with urban reality, and the center with the suburbs in a true alliance that will turn this green movement into a healthy reality. <laughs>